we reach the end of this forum and then it will be nice to be blessed with the words of God spoken by his servant by the name of Pastor Mbiriri. We intentionally ask him to bless us because he experienced a lot of things, especially in discipleship. So we'd like to ask him to come in front and then give him uh, our applause. Um, maybe I may request us to stand and just to stretch for a while. <laughs> um, I'm not so much of a singer, but I would appreciate maybe just uh, the stanza and chorus. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, or maybe the theme song, so that I don't introduce uh, an, a new forum. Our singers. kind and most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the way you have led us since the beginning of this, meet, uh, of this forum. We can truly say Ebenezer, thus far the Lord has been with us. How we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we started with you, may we also end this meeting with you. And we pray that we may have a renewed commitment to faithful discipling. We pray and we praise you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. We praise the Lord so much and I uh, want to thank, we may be seated. I would like to thank the Lord and to thank the organizers of this forum and congratulate them for organizing such a successful meeting as this one. Uh, as someone who's also involved with uh, the other forum for the African, um, IAS African Theological Association, I kind, of, I kind of have an appreciation of what it takes to organize a meeting to run so smoothly. Um, when you see a duck sailing on a lake, it's so smooth. But if you were to be shown the video of what's happening to its feet underneath the water, you would be amazed that there's a lot of footwork underneath. So we've seen the duck sailing quite smoothly. We praise the Lord and we thank you organizers. May the Lord bless you and may this really echo and reverberate throughout the region of Asia and beyond. We pray and... Uh, Pray that uh, this will be 
not just an event, but perhaps the beginning of the rest of our missionary lives. And I also thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to participate in this very important uh, meeting, very important meeting. Growing up as I did in a typical African village, I came to appreciate uh, and to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior in a village, Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I'm not a complicated person. I'm very, very, I mean, I think very basic, very basic person. And as we were growing up, almost all the missionary stories that I remember were always, re in Sabbath school, were always from Asia. And I would always imagine this land of uh, rice fields and, you know, buffaloes that you can plow. I mean, Af African buffaloes are a bit different. <laughs> so we would kind of imagine and, you know, uh, it was quite different, and little did I know that at some point in time I would ever get to Asia, let alone to participate in a meeting such as this one. So I take it really as a great honor, and we praise the Lord so much for that. Now, for my presentation, I've titled uh, this, uh, Please Don't Try This at Home. Don't Try This at Home, and the subtitle is on uh, the cost of discipling. The cost of discipling. I have a, an emphasis not on the soul winning, but the discipling. Um, I'm making here a distinction in my mind, or at least as I begin, to distinguish between baptizing people into uh, fellowship, relationship with Jesus, and growing them, the effort to grow them, to be mature and strong. So I'm not talking about going out to preach, but I'm talking about those who have already accepted. This is where I am. And I'm talking to those whose task it is to nurture these ones. This is where uh, my burden is uh, this afternoon. And you know, this theme really goes to the core of the Great Commission. When we look at the Great Commission uh, in Matthew chapter 28, verse uh, 19 through 20, we find in that small section so many verbs when Jesus gives the Great Commission, but there's only one, most of them are participles, there are a few indicatives, but there's only one imperative. And that imperative is not on the teaching, it's not on the preaching, it's not on the healing, it's not on the baptizing, it's on the making of disciples. So all these activities are futile if they can be there, but if they do not result in the imperative of the command or of the commission, then we have missed the essence of the whole thing. So in other words, the making, is the, that's where the burden is. That is where perhaps we can say the heart of the commission. That is, there's only one imperative in that whole pericope, in that whole section. And so this theme is taking us to that particular imperative of making disciples, uh, those who will be faithful. My brothers and sisters, many times we've talked about the challenges and burdens of discipleship, being a disciple and what the challenges are, and rightfully so. But the burden this evening is on the challenge that confronts those of us whose task it is to nurture others, to grow in faith, those who have accepted the invitation to, uh, to be followers of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we look through the book of Acts, the early church, we find some very interesting scenarios, many interesting things. But this afternoon I'm talking about some people that tried to mimic what the apostles were doing. And I have in mind, for example, Simon from uh, Samaria. Some call him Simon Magus. After seeing what the disciples were doing, empowered by the Holy Spirit, he came with a very fat pace, uh, I mean, a lot of money. And he said to Peter, how much? So that I can also have this Holy Spirit. So that whomever I lay my hands on will receive the Spirit. Peter basically rubbished him and said, may you perish together with your money. This is not about money. A few chapters later, at Ephesus, at chapter 19, when the Lord was doing amazing wonders through the Apostle Paul, 
some sons of Sceva, who was a high priest among the Jews, also tried to do the same thing. They went about, they were itinerant exorcists. And so they went to some place and they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, who, whom Paul preaches, come out, you demon. And the demon said, not, not so fast, not, not so fast. Wait a minute. Paul, I know, <laughs> okay? And, and Jesus, definitely, I know. But we cannot locate you on our radar. Who are you? And the Bible tells us that they were so beaten up and stripped naked, seven strong young men were overpowered by that one demoniac and they left that house both wounded and naked please don't try this at home <laughs> preaching about a jesus whom you don't have a relationship with my dear brothers and sisters the key text that i have chosen for us is in the book of matthew but before we get to that key text let me say we see, for example, in life, we find that marriage is so popular. And many people, where I come from, tend to confuse between a wedding and marriage. And so they will do all they can, working themselves to the bone, to have the best wedding in town. Thousands of dollars. Very expensive weddings, exotic places. People hire planes to go and uh, have their weddings on islands. People hired plane lords of uh, caterers from Asia and other places. Asian rice is popular in those weddings. Balloons from Singapore and everything like that. Carpets from all over the world. Shoes from Italy and you name it. But soon after saying I do, I do, the very next breath they are saying I sue, I sue. <laughs> Confusing a, a wedding and a marriage. Many people will spend so much time planning for the wedding and not a minute for the marriage to come. Even as you conduct marriage, marital counseling, they are busy answering phones on where do we put the chickens? And uh, sorry, Pastor, they, they, we want to know where to refrigerate the chickens. <laughs> my dear brothers and sisters, in my country, it's so easy for someone to get a marriage license, much easier than to get a driver's license. <laughs> Very easy. Is it any wonder then that there are so many accidents uh, on the highway, I mean, the marital highway of life? So many wrecked marriages and families, and many people end up saying this doesn't work. Many people want to be wealthy, and the saying goes, and it's so popular with many, get rich or die trying. And yet the reality is that even in the United States of America, we are told that 80% of the people have never even had one hour of training on personal finance management. Just one hour. And so the tabloids are full of uh, icons whose stories are from riches, I mean from rags to riches and back to rags. <laughs> we hear when we look around, we see, we see it everywhere. The situation where we have so many children whose parents no one really knows where they may be found. It's not too complicated. One does not have to be complicated to produce a child, to bring a fourth child into the world. What is basically needed are two functional reproductive systems. Just make sure one is blue, the other one is pink, and you have a baby. But giving birth is not the same as parenting. Just about anyone can bring forth a life. But not anyone, not just about anyone can successfully parent. There are certain principles and commitments that have to be taken. Basically, my thinking is, when we have so many people baptized, and they come into the church, and then we go on to forget all about them as we plan the next evangelistic campaign, is this not a form of spiritual baby dumping? What is heaven's view when we are busy like this? Is heaven pleased when there's a lot of children being born into the kingdom and there's nobody to take care of them? My dear brothers and sisters, Jesus says something quite disturbing and quite stirring, very bold and piercing, pointed statements. Matthew chapter 23, 
And this is number 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte or one convert. And when he is worn, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Definitely Jesus is acknowledging these people were working hard at bringing people traveling over land and sea. But his burden is on what would happen after the person is one. And Jesus says you make that person worse than they were before they actually accepted Christ. In other words, an evangelism that misses the Christological dimension or paradigm is worse than no evangelism. It's better not to evangelize than to evangelize the wrong way. It's actually better not to evangelize than to do it half-heartedly, to have a half-baked cake. It's actually worse. It's not only ineffective not to evangelize the proper way. It's doing positive harm. It's actually doing positive harm. And Jesus says, it's terrible for you scribes and Pharisees. A chill ran down my spine when I read these pointed words. There is something that was fundamentally wrong then with their discipling methods. Because the kind of yield they were getting at the end of the uh, pipeline was something that did not please heaven at all. All my dear brothers and sisters, we could say a lot about the Sadducees and about the Pharisees. But we wouldn't want to dwell so much on them because they give us a very good example of a very bad example. I would want us to focus rather on something that I think can give us an exemplary paradigm. And mind you, my focus is not on how to bring more people, but what are we doing with those who have come? When we were in grade school, small boys, and so on. You know, it was kind of like a, a very interesting feeling or sensation trying to propose love to a girl. And then you would walk up to this girl, Melody Chipungare. I mean, you've been, I, I mean, this is like grade four, grade, you know? And then you say, I think she loves me because she looked at me one time when we were in class. You walk up to her, and then you tell her, I love you. And then she may actually say, oh, yes, I love you too. Then a small boys would not know what to do, run away, and you don't want to see her again. Is this not like the same that happens in the church? We have worked so hard for someone to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. After that, we have very little interaction with that person. I mean, when people are not yet married, those phone calls, I remember how we, I used to call if my wife also. You know, people call until you are just listening to each other's breath. You have run out of words, but you are still there on the line. But after marriage, many people don't have many words to say to their spouses. Is this also, or maybe uh, this African boy is having a totally mistaken view of the reality in the church. But if my perception is perhaps something that could be uh, said to be true elsewhere, I think we have quite a burden as we come to the close of this forum to really pray for ourselves earnestly those itinerant exorcists tried something, it ended up terribly. When that statement is made, please don't try this at home. It's either, it's some, I mean, this is definitely something that can be very dangerous, but some people, maybe without the proper equipment or supervision or requisite skills, you are not advised to try it. Don't, don't do it. You are better off without trying it. I would suggest that it's the same with evangelism winning people to Christ. If we are not going to do it, we are not going to do it the way Christ intends and the way heaven means it to be done. It is better for us not to do it than to end up with a situation where people are worse off than they were before we approached them. I'm going to end right here. I've been to this passage before, but I still see many lessons You'll pardon me for going back to this one. I once spoke on this one here at Ayas. This is 1 Samuel chapter 30, 30, 3, 0, from verse number 11. We are going back to Ziklag. This is where we are ending uh, 
Dear Mr. President, just allow me to uh, mention a few things here. This is 1 Samuel 30, from verse number 11. And it says here, Then they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David, and they gave him bread and he ate, and they let him drink water, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk water for three days and three nights. Then David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? And he said, I am a young man from Egypt, servant of an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion of the southern area of the Keratites in the territory which belongs to Judah and the southern area of Caleb. We burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Can you take me down to this troop? So he said, Swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this troop. And when he had brought him down, there they were, spread out over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. Then David attacked, he pounced on them unexpectedly. My dear brothers and sisters, I see so many uh, things here, that, a few things that I would like to point out, which to me suggests that we may find a paradigm for discipling in this maybe unlikely passage for this kind of theme. We find these soldiers who are moving with David on a mission to recover some people that have been abducted by an Amalekite uh, team of uh, robbers. And as David is leading this team, they come to the river Beso, and of the 600, 200 are too tired to cross the river. David is able to cross with 400 men. And as they, soon after crossing, they meet, they find this man all, all on the brink of death. He's almost dead. And so they get to this, they take this man, this is where we started our reading, they took him, the, they found him, that's the first verb, they found him. And then I'm interested in the verbs that follow after the finding. This to me is like, uh, this is someone who's accepted to follow Christ. Okay, let me say. But they find him. But what follows? They brought him to David. They didn't bring him to a program. They didn't bring him to a church faction. They didn't bring him to vegetarianism. They didn't bring this man to an ideology. They brought him to a person. And they brought him to David. It was while he was in the shadow of, I mean, or in David's shadow, or being sheltered by David uh, from the shimmering heat of that Mediterranean sun, that they started ministering to him to restore and revive him, bring him back to his health, health again. And the Bible gives us uh, four verbs of the actions that they took. They were, there was more action after the finding than before. They did more after. You, where I come from, usually the church does more before and almost nothing after. Where I come from. Almost anything before and almost nothing after. But this is not the case here. And who are these they? The Bible tells us that when David was anointed uh, to be king, Saul went ballistic. His anger and fury knew no bounds. And in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, David becomes a fugitive. And in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20, we find some people joining. Uh, in fact, in, in 1 Samuel 16, he's anointed. 1 Samuel 20, he becomes a fugitive. 22 verse 2, David is joined by 400 men. And the Bible tells us that these 400 men were people that were basically bankrupt and good for nothing. People that had been considered the failures in life. They were miserable people. Good for nothing. 400 people are joining a man who has been anointed by heaven to be the new king of Israel. 400 useless men. 
And when we come to the river, Beso, there are 600. 200 remained. Only 400 crossed with David. They are equally tired, but their commitment is greater. Let me suggest to us that they had seen grace, love, and acceptance in David. And it is this love which gave them the energy to bring another helpless soul to a place of healing and restoration at the feet of David. Because they had experienced the same, they could extend it to another helpless soul, a man who is on the verge of dying, a man who has already one foot in the grave. He is sick, he is dehydrated, he is hungry, he is roasting in the sun in, by day and freezing by night. And they bring this soul, three days, they bring this soul to David and they minister to him. They are so busy attending to this man until, the Bible says, until he regained his strength, until he was strong. Only then does David open his mouth to talk to him. Not before. Only then. After so much has already been done by this team of church members and pastors working together, each one in their own field, to bring this man back to good health. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, in the field that the world is, there are many people that are disheartened, that are disillusioned, that are disappointed, that are frustrated, that are heartbroken. There are many people who have almost on the verge of giving up on life. They need someone who has experienced the love of Christ to bring them not just to dump and then get away, but to be there with them until they regain their strength and energy. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, David asks two questions. To whom do you belong and where do you come from? Do we ever take time to really get to know the people that we baptize? Or those baptizing and those being baptized are total strangers, perfect strangers. Is it any wonder then that when people go out the back door, no one notices, and even if we notice, no one cares because you never knew the person in the first place. David was interested to know who this person is, where they are coming from. He wanted to know. And of course, in the process, he also gained very vital information. Very vital information. And the Bible tells us that the man opened his mouth, um, an Egyptian, servant of an Amalekite, and then he narrated his ordeal, what had happened to him three days before, how he had come to be in this kind of situation. And David never utters a word, even though they destroyed Ziklag, his very city, even though they had abducted the families of all the men here involved, but David never says anything to him. He looks beyond the man's fault to see his deepest need. This is an exemplification of true love and acceptance without condemning the man. And after David speaks to him, and the man has poured his heart out and says, but my master left me here three days ago. David eventually goes to challenge him and says, can you lead me to these people? You know, it's very interesting when you look at the personal pronouns that are used. I am the, I'm an Egyptian. I'm a servant of an Amalekite. My master did this and... But David comes to pointing at him and says, can you lead me to those people? Now, this is a call that David makes, an appeal that he makes at last. Do, do, do you know that there are places in the world, in our church, where when you go to preach, your advice, please don't make a call. <laughs> don't try to coerce people. You just make a lecture. Let people just decide on their own. But David makes a call. Can you? Now, this is not a simple question. <laughs> it's not just a question about ability. It has to do with allegiance and change of, uh, of in loyalty. Because this man has just said in the previous statement, um, my master left me. In other words, he's still identifying with that master. And David says, can you lead me? Who are you for me to obey you? In other words, but... By God's grace, this man, because of the love that has been shown to him, the care, the nature, he switches his allegiance over to David. And he says, on one condition, provided you will not hand me over to my master and you will not kill me. If you promise this too, I'm willing to follow you. 
It's not easy. Many considerations are made when people are making decisions. But as disciple makers together with Christ, what is our level of commitment of helping with, or at least in ameliorating or alleviating some of the challenges that come with these kind of decisions? David, I'm sure David assured this man that I'll be with you. And hence he made the decision. He made the commitment as I draw to a close. This man didn't want to have anything more to do with his old master. He says, please, don't give me over to my master. Why? Because once he had been subjected under his tyrannical rule, after that being subjected, he had been rejected and ejected and left dejected. Fortunately, David brought him back in. He had been used and refused. And he didn't want a repeat of that experience. Are there no people who don't want to hear anything to do with Seventh-day Adventism? Who have been here in this place, wherever the congregations may be, but who will say, please, <laughs> no, not, not those people. Not those people. Are there no people like that? Are we concerned? Do we care? Do we miss them? Do we think about them? I sometimes tend to think that those people who get baptized and remain faithful and strong in the church are really, I don't know, maybe it's because of some connections that they are able to make or somehow establish on their own. But as a church, I believe we need to be much more deliberate uh, than probably we have been before. The Bible says here, when David got to where those people were, in other words, this man immediately is engaged in mission. He didn't wait another, uh, for 10 years. Immediately, he is involved in David's mission. He is leading the whole battalion. And he says, I know where to find those people. Because this person has just been one. He still knows where to get those in whose presence he has been in the recent past. Those people that are recently baptized, they still have ties and connections. And that can be highly influential in bringing others to Christ. And last but not least, we find here, my dear brothers and sisters, that the people that David was pursuing were found eating and drinking and dancing. <laughs> they were totally oblivious to the fate of the men they had left behind, totally oblivious to their own imminent destruction. And when David descended upon them, that attack was as unexpected as it was ferocious and relentless. It was brutal and unrelenting as David fought tooth and nail to liberate his family members and all the other family members of his soldiers who had been taken by this troop of soldiers. But these words, these words, eating and drinking and dancing, merrymaking, sound quite ominous to my eschatological ears. For somewhere Jesus talks about the condition of the world before he comes. A lot of eating and merrymaking and dancing and whatever before Jesus comes in Luke chapter 17. Before Jesus comes. I just pray that the church will not be part of this kind of scenario where maybe we are going on. We have had this person among us Somehow they've dropped out whatever difficulty they encountered, none of our problem, and they are falling out by the numbers. But the church, like that Amalekite troop, keeps marching on, leaving the field behind littered with the former members who no one cares about. No one even tends to check what's, going, what's happening. No one cares to go and check back. Meanwhile, we are enjoying whatever has come from the land of, the, of Judah, whatever the tithes and offerings have come. We are all over the place, and we have nice offices. We have air corn. We have, now, the, all these things are not sins. But may the church, when Jesus gave this warning, he was giving to believers, when he says, be careful that you are not caught in this situation. And when Jesus gives that, it's because there is a great risk when Jesus gives such a warning. My dear brothers and sisters, my heart is pounding within me. What is my condition? Have I cared or I have been totally oblivious? No better than the Amalekites. 
Jesus says, finally, Matthew 5, verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, our key text, Jesus gives a warning to the Pharisees. He says, your methods of discipling are terrible. In fact, you are worse off by what you are doing. And Jesus then says, unless you exceed the Pharisees, forget about heaven. Now, we don't mean this to be a wet blanket and uh, have an anticlimax to a great meeting. But I'm saying, may the Lord help us to really not be too excited about numbers, but the faithfulness in nurturing that is required of us by heaven. God is more concerned perhaps with those who are already in because whatever we do to those who are already in is the same thing that will attract those who are still out. And this is my prayer. This is the challenge. The burden that I have in my heart. May our righteousness, may our evangelistic methods exceed those of the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees would bring them all in, but in the end, the situation was worse. The Amalekites would recruit, but those who fell from among them, they would just live to die and be eaten by vultures in the open fields. They didn't care about them. May that not be the case with us and those that we reach out to and they accept. And eventually, we don't care what happens. We continue marching on to Zion and we are eating and we are singing about sweets on the fields of Zion. They were eating sweets here. But Jesus says, unless your righteousness, and I believe even our evangelistic methods, exceed those of the Pharisees, uh, we still need to pray and plead with heaven. May God bless us. Um, if it is your prayer, if it is your prayer, for God to help us as a movement, that Adventist movement worldwide, to be more caring and concerned, even with those who are already in, in working with them until they become strong, so winners also. Uh, in praying for this, if this is also your concern and your prayer, may you please stand up so that we commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Let us close our eyes. Our kind and most gracious Heavenly Father, may glory and honor come to you, for only you are worthy to be praised. We can not but only praise you for what you've done for us this weekend. So many insights, so many challenges, probing papers and uh, answers that are seeking to bring us closer to your will and desire. We pray for ourselves as representatives of the Advent, Advent movement worldwide, and especially here in Asia with the great and enormous challenges that face your mission in this part of the world. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, may you give us hearts that have been touched by love, as David's soldiers had been, so that we can be so caring. May we not be reckless as Amalekites, or try to find our own methods as the Sadducees and Pharisees. May you help us only to follow Jesus' example. We pray for every one of us, in your name, now and forever. Amen.